So after hearing a lot about surgical treatment options for cartilage defects, it's a great pleasure for me to give you some insights in the rehabilitation concept after these kind of injuries. Um, we already heard today that we both have non-surgical and surgical treatment options and the most common surgical treatment, op treatment options include the microfracture technique, osteochondral transplantation and the AC technique and its further advancements like the MACI. All are aiming to reduce discomfort of patients and increase quality of life and in particular in sports people, they really want to resume the sport activities. There are several factors which might influence the outcome after cartilage repair technique. Um, regarding the AC techniques, it is, we find in literature that a successful cell culturing under good practice conditions plays an important role. Also the expertness of the surgeons, patient's compliance, which is a very important factor, both in the pre- and the post-operative treatment regime, and of course, a safe and progressive rehabilitation program. Interesting is that we find a lot of hints in literature that rehabilitation is very important. We have to admit that the evidence, which kind of um, rehabilitation is the best one, we are still lacking. So what are now the aims of rehabilitation after the cartilage repair techniques? We have two aims, which seems to be quite controversial when looking to it at the first time. On the one hand, we want to promote the biological process, the healing process of the repair tissue by creating an optimal environment. On the other hand, we want to return the patient to an optimal level of function so that he is able to do ADLs and sport activities. How can we promote the healing process? On the one hand, it's important to support the nutrition of the joint um, and again to restore joint homeostasis. On the other hand, we should really aim to minimize shear forces, which might be, co which might be dangerous for the healing tissue. In particular, compressive forces combined with shear forces should be avoided in particular in the first period of rehabilitation. And we know that cartilage and also the repair tissue lacks intermittent pressure. What do we need to return the patient to a good function is neuromuscular training, a good strength situation, and also that the patient is able to do sport-specific tasks. And if we want to minimize shear forces and compression forces combined with shear forces, it might be controversial by regaining strength training. So I think it's important to see rehabilitation as a process and after cartilage repair tissue, the fundamental should be built by the maturation process of the cartilage tissue. Because this is, gives us important information on the biochemical properties and also on the biomechanical properties of the tissue. And so you, we can really appreciate the forces that will be exerted on the area and we can adapt our rehabilitation modalities. Based on this, this is very important to look to the nature of the defect, in particular to the size and the location, and also to the clinical biomechanics of the affected joint. Considering this, we can then implement our rehabilitation modalities, like the resumption of weight-bearing activities and loading activities, restoration of range of motion, and also strengthening and neuromuscular control. Um, as I told you, the basis should be the healing process of the tissue and we know that there is a huge difference between the different techniques and we know that the AC technique has the longest process of maturation. In particular, in the first six weeks, we have real a very, very soft tissue with just cell attachment, but the cells didn't start to produce the metrics. This happens up to the 12 weeks and to the six months and the maturation phase, so where the tissue is really getting hard, starts at the six months and we still don't know when it will end. The microfracture techniques is quite is not so sensible. We have in the first four weeks a soft tissue, but already after eight weeks, we can find an increase of collagen type two, which gives us the information that the tissue is able to withstand compressive forces, and we also find a complete coverage and filling of the defect. The fastest maturation process we can observe in the osteochondral transplantation where the plaques were united within four weeks and after eight weeks we also see on the surface the fibrocartilage tissue. 
Now, which role plays the nature of the defect and the clinical biomechanics if we look to this regarding the knee? We know that the tibial femoral joint is very sensitive to axial loading, so we should be careful with increasing weight-bearing activities. However, there is no need for restriction of range of motion activities, in particular in unloaded position. However, the patellofemoral joint is not so sensitive to weight bearing, in particular if you put the knee to an extension near position. However, you have to be careful with your range of motion activities because with increasing flexion, the pressure increases in the patellofemoral joint, which might be delicious for your healing tissue. We also know the smaller the defect, the more you can progress or the faster you can progress within your rehabilitation program and the larger the defect, the slower you should progress within your rehabilitation modalities. If you now come back to the rehab process, we can divide this process in three phases. The first phase is characterized by protection. The sec in the second phase, you can start to resume functional activities and the third phase is the activity phase, which is very important in particular for sports people. Again, don't forget that the biological repair, the maturation process should build the basis of these phases. In the protection phase, our repair tissue is cotton-like. In the function phase, it's more getting dough. And in the activity phase, it's like you can compare it with a rubber. So what are now the modalities, or first of all, what is the aim in the protection phase? Try to put no load on the repair zone, try to protect the repair zone, try to regain muscle control, and enhance joint circulation. How can you achieve these aims? By controlled weight-bearing activities and range of motion control, stimulate the healing tissue by joint circulation exercises, passive modalities, in particular CPM, but as well start to implement active, active motilities. This, is also, this should also be the main components in this first phase. As I said, it's very important to put no or low load on the repair site, and therefore it's very important to have an idea on which side is our defect. For example, if you have a lesion in the patellofemoral joint and the patellar lesion is inferior or at the trochlear superior, we can perform loading activities in 60 to 110 degrees of knee flexion because we know there is no articulation of our defect. On the opposite, if your lesion is in the superior part of the patellar or in the inferior part of the trochlea, implement loading activities in 20 to 60 degree of flexion. This will be beneficial. If you have your defect in the tibiofemoral joint, it's axial loading, which might be delicious for the repair tissue. So if you have a defect in the anterior aspect of your um, femoral condyle, implement your activities in about 10 degree of flexion. If you have a defect which is in the central part of the femoral condyle, the most part, the many of the defects in the femoral joint are situated in the central part, you can perform activities in a flexion angle above 60 degrees. And if you have a defect which is in the posterior part of your femoral condyle, then you can do your exercises or your weight-bearing activities in full extension. This provides us low load postures for the repair zone. What about resumption of weight-bearing activities? Um, in the femoral joint, you should be cautious with resumption of weight-bearing activities. And literature tells us that if you resume your full weight-bearing activities, activities between four to eight, this might be beneficial for the healing craft. Um, we don't have too much evidence on weight-bearing activities after cartilage repair in the patellofemoral joint, but it's suggested to perform partial weight-bearing up to the fourth week with 50% of the body weight. However, the brace has to be closed near to the extension position to avoid high pressure in the patellofemoral joint. Range of motion or the resumption of range of motion is very important as cartilage needs movements. There is no need for restriction of range of motion in the tibiofemoral joint, in particular if you perform these exercises in unloaded position. However, respect pain and diffusion and perform a progressive gradual increase. If you, you, if you perform your range of motion exercises in weight-bearing position, do it in safe ranges, which means out of the defect zone, and be aware that no shear forces happens over the repair site. 
Range of motion control is very important in the patellofemoral joint. Again, perform a slow increase between 20 to 60 degrees. If you have a defect at the inferior part of the patellar or the um, superior part of the trochlear, if your defect is located in the superior part of the patellar or the inferior part of the trochlear, um, perform a slow increase between 60 and 110 degrees and avoid again shear forces over the repair zone. Joint circulation exercises are in this phase very important. What is the science behind it? We know that these exercises support joint, lab joint lubrication and cartilage nutrition. How does it look in our practice? Perform it pain-free in mid-range motions. Try to do it every day without resistance. Implement CPM, also stationary cycling is an opportunity. And perform active range of motion exercises in closed kinetic chains. Regaining muscle control is in this first phase also important, but more with the aspect to stimulate recruitment of muscle fibers. So we start with isometric exercises of the quadriceps and the hamstring in varying uh, knee angles. Again, be aware to reduce shear forces and provide compression forces over the repair site to give an optimal stimulus for the repair tissue. What is also very important in this phase is to activate the hip muscles, as we know that they play a major role in the lower limb alignment. So take care of your weight barrier restriction when you perform the exercises, but do it. What about the next phase? It's the function phase. The aim in this phase is we start to bring low loads on the cartilage repair site. We again perform joint circulation exercises in safe ranges. However, it's now very important to maximize, maximize the muscle control. So main modalities in this phase are to maximize muscle control and functional control and to start already with low impact during ADLs and functional activities. Why is muscle control so important for these patients? We know that muscles are responsible for static and dynamic stabilization of the joint. We know that they are necessary to control movement and to absorb forces acting on the knee. How should we do it in this particular patient population? We should really start with low load and we should really aim for a low, slow progression. We should perform it in safe ranges and very important, there should be no reactivity after strength training. So if your patient shows pain and diffusion after the strength training, you have to go one step back. So, to fulfill the requirements of this patient group, we continue in this phase with isometrics, but we use now resistance in varying knee flexion angles. We then go further to concentric in partial weight bearing position and also in closed kinetic chains. We start with shock art movements, not over the full range and out of the defect zone. Then we um, increase the load if we put the patients in weight bearing positions. Again, start with short arc movements out of the defect zones. As soon as your patient is in a standing position, really be aware of a good functional alignment and that no pain and diffusion occurs during your exercises. Again, as I told you in the talk before, the functional joint alignment is very important for these patients. Situations here, as we can see it on the right picture, shows us that this patient has a real weak core stability, real weak hip muscles, and also the debil torsion and foot pronation is affected. This leads to increased load in the joint and might also increase the load on the cartilage repair tissue. So start in this phase with training of the core stability and really emphasize the training of your hip, um, hip abductors and external rotators. Now when it comes to the activity phase, which is the first phase of the return to sports phase, now we have the aim to increase the loads progressively and we should really look for a good posture and movement quality. So the main aims or the main modalities in this phase should address to maximize muscle control and a progressive increase of load also now adapted to sports specific activities. Now you can increase with your concentric muscle strength exercises in weight bearing positions over the full range of motion. You should now really implement with eccentrics. We know that eccentric muscle training is very important for absorbing loads acting on the knee. We will start this in long weight bearing position and then continue to short uh, to um, full weight bearing positions. 
again in this phase when you now increase the load, movement quality has to be first. We don't want unsafe and high movements in your knee and we really do not want abnormal load in the medical compartment, in the medial compartment of the, of the knee joint. So really take your time to address movement dysfunction and really try to correct it in this phase. This is really very important for the cartilage tissue and of course for the patient. It's again a poor proximal control and we keep muscles which are mainly important for a bad quality of movements. And after you have addressed this, you can then start with increasing load and then you can start to resume moderate and high impact activities. Then you can increase additional weight and resistance. You can implement plyometric training and jumping exercises based on the sport your patient is doing. Now I would like to cover shortly the point of return to play after cartilage repair. We know from studies and we already heard today that return to sport is possible. However, we have a huge difference in the return rate and also in the timing of return. Um, can we safely um, um, recommend our patients a return to sport after cartilage? We are not quite sure at this moment. The second thing is, should time be the only criteria when returning to sports? At the moment, it seems that time is one of the main factors. However, we have a lot of evidence that time should not be the only factor to return the patients to a um, safe sports activity. There are several criteria suggested which we should take under consideration before sending the patients back to the sports. This is the nature of the lesion. This is the surgery itself and concomitant procedures, as we heard before regarding, for example, ACL. This should be the clinical assessment. It should be based on the radiological assessment, on a physical assessment, functional testing, and also the results of subjective outcome scores. I would now like to cover some of these aspects. I think it's very important that it does not make sense to let the patient return to sport with a knee like this. So there should be no pain and no effusion, no catching and no locking and no instability. For radiological assessment, Matt told us some opportunities how to assess um, cartilage repair techniques. I think that the MOCOT score is a good tool, in particular the parts filling of the defect, the subchondral bone and the fusion gives us important information regarding criteria return to sports. If the defect is not fully filled, if we really find an edema in the subchondral bone and if we have if still effusion, these are not good, uh, not good um, not good situation to let the patient return to the sport. Very important, and we learned a lot from ACL in this case, is the physical assessment. There should be full range of motion. There should be a good muscle strength. And what we now found is that during isokinetic testing, which is a proper, met proper method to assess muscle strength, it should be at least 90% of the unaffected limb before the patient is, can be able to return to sport. A further part is functional assessment, and again, we learned a lot from our ACL patients. It seems that these HOP tests are a perfect tool to get information about the functional um, condition of the patient. There are four different tests suggested, and it's again, there should be 90% of the uninfected limb before your patient is able to a safe return to sport. And I think, to my point of view, a very important factor is the subjective evaluation of the patient's uh, condition. And so I can advise to use the subjective outcomes course, in particular the CRUISE and the IKTC 2000. They are really validated for this patient population and they are also reliable and also sensitive. So I think it really makes sense to get information how is the patient estimating his situation. So, what is my take-home message? I think cartilage repair really needs an individualized rehabilitation, which is based on the defect location and also on patient demands. Joint circulations in the early phase of rehab are very important. Consider the biomechanics of the affected joint. Really take your time for a slow and controlled increase of loading exercises and activities. Really take care that the movement quality is good, so movement dysfunction really needs to be addressed. 
The decision about time of returning to sport should be time-based, of course, but in addition, we should use some criteria. We have already some criteria, but we are also lacking evidence about this criteria after cartilage repair. So we need to define this criteria for cartilage repair patients. We need to evaluate this criteria, and we have to ask the question, maybe there is the need to develop new criteria. So I think this is a part where a lot of work is waiting for us. Thank you for your attention.